church too. Hey, good morning. How are you doing getting things ready for tonight or tomorrow? How many of you husbands just need to stay out of the way for the next 24 hours? Yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand. Good. Well, I am thankful for my wife who really takes over stuff at this time of year. And we're excited about having uh, all of our kids and all of our grandkids tomorrow in, uh, in a fluke of the calendar. They're all able to be with us tomorrow. So we're happy about that. And when it comes to Christmas time, don't most of us try to get everything just right because we want it, after all, to feel like Christmas. Some of us are really excited that there's no snow out there, that there's moderate temperatures and that everything is clean and neat and wonderful and it's just beautiful outside. And then there are others who feel like it is not Christmas without at least this much snow and snow falling on Christmas Eve. But we, we all try to, we, we want it to feel like Christmas. We want it to be whatever Christmas we remember from the past, whatever it was like that, that we grew up with. And uh, I'm grateful for those who've come and and they decorate uh, the church and it's so beautiful and it looks so good and reminds us of Christmas. It just wouldn't be Christmas without, you know, fill in the blank and we've all got different things that we would put in there. However, when you go to what they call the infancy narratives, the stories about Jesus when he was little in the Bible, you find a very different situation. And actually, when you get any of us alone and talking, you'll find that even though the the shine and the gleam of Christmas may be on the outside, all of us are still dealing with stuff and we all still struggle with things. And it's never just that, that perfect ornament of a life or a situation for each of us. Today we're going to look at a great passage, Matthew chapter 2. It's just a short little snippet of a part of the Christmas story, and it's the one about the magi, the wise men, because after all, what says Christmas better than these astrologers from Baghdad? I mean, makes sense to me, right? They come uh, traveling some 1,500 miles. Now, you would think coming from Persia over to Bethlehem, they would only have about 900 miles. But fortunately, they would have to travel through the Saudi Arabian desert if they were going to go that way. They had to go north and over and then south into Bethlehem. And they had a long journey. But what says Christmas better than, you know, the guys with the, uh, with the headdresses from, from Iran. But that's what God decided to put in Matthew chapter two and be, make it part of the Christmas story. And thankfully, that actually shows us that we're, we're included too. So, the wise travelers did not miss the Messiah. Last year we talked about how Israel, and the, the leaders of Israel, they missed the Messiah. But these wise travelers didn't And we're going to look at part two of Jesus in the Old Testament because in this passage of Matthew 2, there are three times when uh, the writer refers back to the Old Testament. So the few paragraphs in Matthew describing the experience of the wise men, they're actually filled with challenges for us, with meaning for us, as they followed God's call all the way from Iran. But first... um, This story teaches us that God's will for our lives isn't always easy. In fact, it's just the opposite. Are you waiting for following Jesus to get easy? It's rewarding, it's fulfilling, it's satisfying, it's encouraging, but it is very rarely described as easy. It's usually just the opposite because to follow Jesus requires courage and faith and sacrifice and obedience. Following Jesus involves all of those things. 
Now, if you think about anything in your life, if you're going off to college to, get, to pre- prepare for a career, if you're going to get married, if you're going to be a parent, if you're going to try to follow God in anything in life, it's not going to be easy. Um, I don't, if, if you think marriage is easy, it's because you're not married yet. <laughs> That's why. So you just have to get married and then realize that it's not, you know, it's not easy. It's rewarding. It's thrilling. It should be, right, filled with love and with adventure and with fulfillment and satisfaction. But it's not, it's not easy. So looking uh, at these pictures reminds us that in the Middle East today, uh, from a historical and academic perspective, um, not much has changed. What's happening in the Middle East is nothing new. From a human perspective, it's horrific and unimaginably painful to witness, and, and we do witness it in our day and age. We do witness it. But in Matthew chapter 2, there's also horror. And so that's 2,000 years ago. Then you go back 2,000 years before that in the Bible, there's horror and pain and fighting. And you go all the way back to the beginning. In chapter 3 of Genesis, we see the word enmity, that, that budding of, of heads and that caused conflict and, and even death. So as we look here at Matthew chapter 2, we're going to find that what's going on today is not a whole lot different than what was going on back then. And even though we would think by now, somehow, we would have a world minus that kind of destruction and carnage, sadly, we're still that sinful human race that took the fruit from the tree way back in Genesis chapter three. But there's seven short sections here in Matthew chapter two, so here's the first one. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they said, where's this one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Here's the lead in this section. Gentiles are looking for the Messiah. Right here at the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of Jesus' life, Gentiles are coming, not just Gentiles, but Gentiles who are wise men. They're probably either priests or astrologers, uh, maybe uh, civil leaders, and they're coming from Iran, Persia, then Persia, modern-day Iran, probably from the area. Let me put another one of these in. I had one, and I don't cough all week until I get up here in front of you. Then it, then it works on me. Um, Gentiles, these guys that came probably from the area of Baghdad or Babylonia, maybe back in that day. Can you imagine two, maybe one or two years into Jesus' life, these guys from across the world show up and they've got this story about a star and they're astrologers and astronomers and they look at the stars and then they, they read into it. They're getting messages, but here's what happened. God decided to reveal himself to them. God saw those guys and said, man, they're searching, they're searching, they're searching. I'm gonna let them find something. Are, are you searching? Because in, in the Old Testament, it says that if someone searches with all their heart, they'll find God. These guys were searching for something that they knew was beyond them something that they knew was bigger than they were, was way out there. They saw order. They saw a creator. They were searching. They likely didn't know what they were searching for. 
but they were searching. And God said, I'm going to let them find the Messiah. The lead is that they're not the people of God. They're Gentiles. And these Gentiles were drawn in by God. Last I checked, there's not that many Jewish people by blood in the room today. So we're all Gentiles. You know, God is, God is offering you to, to, to find whatever it is you're searching for. If you're searching for meaning, if you're searching for something beyond yourself, you're searching for your life to, to mean more than a nine to five job or to making other people happy. God wants you to find what you're looking for. Way back in Jesus' first year or two, God sees these guys over in Persia. He said, I, I want them to find what they're looking for. They don't know what. And they, they make this trek. They come all the way over, and it's just, it's amazing to me that the people in the town where the Messiah was, most of them weren't even aware he was even there. They didn't even know. There was no big deal going on. There were no lights, like I said last week. There were no signs or arrows. Yeah. So, the second section, uh, verse 3. Dude, you're so nice. Thank you. They say that cold water actually exacerbates it. But I don't know. I'm willing to take a chance. There's just this one little spot. Okay, verse 3, second section. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed that, that they were looking for the king of the Jews. And all Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Because when Herod gets disturbed, everybody gets disturbed. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has, ri has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod, ultra-paranoid, he was just the, uh, the leader of this little section of the Roman Empire. Caesar Augustus, who was the emperor of the empire, used to say about Herod, who was so paranoid, he would kill sons, he would kill wives in order to con have a control of power. Caesar Augustus said of him, it's better to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. And the word son and the word pig in that language sounded the same. So it was a play on words. But Herod, Herod was known to be so, so controlling, so egomaniacal, and so paranoid that the people around him were all, all ready to get their heads lopped off at any moment. The Jewish leaders, interestingly enough, they were more concerned with their power than their people or their God. They weren't looking for Jesus. Somehow, the Messiah had come. Somehow they knew that he would be born in Bethlehem, and somehow they still missed it. There he was, over yonder, maybe five miles down the road, and uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't see it. They didn't see it coming, and he was right there. So they quote Micah. They know, it's so crazy, they know how to answer Herod. They have the answers. So they, they know the scriptures, but they don't know the God of the scriptures. My biggest fear for church people, including myself, is that we know the scriptures, we know the religion, we know the traditions, we know the things to do, but we miss God. It had been 400 years since a prophet spoke and the people were there going through the motions. The religious leaders were propping up the religion, the godless religion, in name only, in name only. Jesus said to the religious leaders, Isaiah spoke well of you when he said that these people honor me 
with their words and with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What an indictment. Their hearts would be far from him. Let me tell you, there have been many Sunday mornings, early, when I'm at home in my office, and I say, Jeff, your heart is far from God today. And I know that sometimes the only reason any of us wouldn't say it is because we're just not thinking about it. Because we're just kind of going through life and we're busy and we got stuff going on and we just, we just one foot in front of the other one day after the week after week after month and, and sometimes we're just so used to the stuff that we do that if we thought about it, we'd realize, wow, our, our hearts are far from God. I have to actually stop, turn the music off, turn the podcast off, turn the TV off, shut the computer down. I have to get alone, and I have to just meditate and think, God, what are you doing in my life? What am I doing with you in my life? Because I'm busy and I'm going through the motions, and I want to draw closer to you. And this, this picture here of a king who asks the religious leaders in this group in his little fiefdom, hey, hey, where's the Messiah gonna be born? They know, just like that, they know, but they missed him. I mean, there's not another one gonna come. There's not gonna be two. He's not gonna come again the same way he came the first time. The first time he comes to save. The second time when he comes, he comes to judge. It's not like you get at bat a second time to maybe catch the Messiah when he comes sailing across the plate. No, it's not gonna happen again. And we see that as we read this passage. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we missing him? One day of our hearts being far from God is one day too many. And, and all of us have a lot of days racked up, if we were honest. Verse seven is the third section. Then Herod called the Magi secretly. Hey guys, come here. He found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and he said, hey, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him too. He was power hungry, he was controlling, he was an egomaniac, he was paranoid, he was also lazy because he asked these guys to go and do what he could have gone and done. He's got, he's got authority over the whole area. He could have gone in, he could have turned the homes upside down, he could have found this child. Bethlehem wasn't more than a 1,000 people, probably in the few hundreds. There weren't that many people. But he sends them, and God, God is gonna say, no, no, I'm not gonna let you do that. I'm not gonna let you do that. It's, it's so interesting, you, you got this tension, and the tension's in our lives too. The tension is God's will and what God wants to do and accomplish, and then the world with all of us in it. With all of us with free will, and the, the powers in this world, and the things that are working against God, and so you've got these two things in tension, and you see it here in the passage, in, uh, in the fourth section, verses nine through 12. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star, the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Lot of research on this star. Lot of stories on the star. David, you and me sat and watched this long movie about the star, the star of Bethlehem. There's all kinds of research, all kinds of uh, astronomical information. We don't know for sure. We don't know for sure, but we do know for sure what it says here, that these guys saw a star that directed them. And in, in verse 10 it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. That's, I mean, I, I guess I'm just really introspective when it comes to the scriptures. But I, I ask myself when I see that, When's the last time I physically bowed down to worship 
God. I mean, I do it in my office. If I'm going to do it, I do it in my office. I get down on the floor. Sometimes I get on my knees, sometimes I lay on my stomach. But that's what they did. These guys were foreigners. They had great wealth. These, guys, these were important people. They came in, they recognized, wow, look who's here. This, this is the king that has been born. And as far as we know, other than in the temple, when he was dedicated, we don't really know of other people coming and bowing down before this infant king. But they did it. They were Gentiles. That, that, that said that there was hope. There was hope for all people. There was hope for everyone in the world. There was hope for me. Then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And there's probably other reasons why we give gifts, but this would be one of them. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another, depending on where you're from, route or route. (laughs) Verse 10, when was the last time you were overjoyed when God revealed his will to you? When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They'd, They'd invested a lot in finding God's will for them, and then in getting to the will of God in their lives. And now they were there. And then they bowed down and they worshiped him. That's challenging to me. And they returned to their country. Where'd they go? They went back to Baghdad. They were the first international missionaries recorded in scripture. When Jesus was only a year or two old, They come and they see him, they worship him. They display their faith in this little child. We don't know a lot, but we know that Gentiles would come to faith. And the Gentiles would come from other lands. And over the millennia, Gentiles will come. They haven't all come yet. Someday we'll all go. Many of us will be there on that part of the planet. And then they went back, and you think they talked about this king that they went to worship? Hey, where have you guys been for the last two months? Oh, we got to tell you. And how that maybe softened the ground for the next 30, 40, 50 years as news of this king would come? They were the first international missionaries, the, the fifth section of this. It says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Wow, that crazy people in that land today, today would love to escape to Egypt. Not the Jewish people, but the Palestinians, but they can't. But he was told to escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod, which was only a couple years. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. After the high of the wise men, I mean, that had to be pretty amazing. So last week I talked about a little boy who was so well behaved and afterwards I got to meet the parents and I would imagine they were, they were pleased with that, but I'm no magi, <laughs> right? What if you had a, a, a delegation of wise men, international guys coming and then dropping like precious, uh, uh, expensive stuff in your home? That's a pretty big high. That's amazing. Wow, we, uh, we did pretty good here with this first boy, even though of course people think he's illegitimate and we're kind of the scuttlebutt around town, but something is good here because these guys came. Well, now all of a sudden there's death threats. There's death threats. The, um, he says, uh, Herod's gonna search for the child to, 
to kill him. Joseph and Mary weren't expecting that. Sometimes, isn't it true, sometimes when we follow God, we're like, okay, I'm right where, I'm right where I should be. Some of you are back home from college, and so you know that maybe God has called you to a certain school, and you believe that, and you go there, and you're there for two months, and and this just is not working out. I don't think this is, I think I missed the will of God because maybe some stuff is going on. Maybe you got some death threats. I don't know. Maybe somebody's going to punch you out if you leave the dorm. But often we face opposition when we're following God. Very often. Hardly ever is there no opposition if we're really following Jesus and doing what it is he wants us to do. The will of God is not always easy, but it can often be dangerous and difficult. The sixth section, verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. The coming of Jesus was met with anger and fury and killing, and death. And we don't have to look farther than our smartphones today to see anger, and killing, and fury, and death in several parts of the world. Some people who are following Jesus, many who are not, are facing anger, and fury, and killing, and death. And it makes me wonder, with, uh, with J- Joseph and Mary, with the wise men, with us, what are we willing to sacrifice to follow Jesus? I remember as a kid, a um, young teenager, hearing stories from missionaries and hearing stories about missionaries who went to serve and were, were killed on the mission field. And I remember as a young guy thinking, I'll do that, I'll, I'll serve Jesus, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything. I'd be willing to die, then I could have my name in a little biography somewhere. I'd be willing to do that. And then the older you get, I think naturally, if you don't practice and and work that muscle, you get less willing because you've got a lot more to lose. You've got home and family and job and maybe property or treasure You've got more to lose and you're less willing to just go and serve. But to live for Jesus means that we're gonna sacrifice. And and we don't live in that kind of a culture. There's some people today who are living in that kind of a culture that didn't think they lived in that kind of a culture. But today they're having to sacrifice in order to follow Jesus. And then the last section, Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And again, having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. God often makes mid-course corrections in our life's journey, doesn't he? We're kind of going in one way and we think we're being obedient, we think we're following God, and all of a sudden something changes and we, we have to turn and we have to go in a different direction. Are we willing to be flexible? Are we willing to be mobile? Are we willing to allow God to change our course? 
these guys were going back to Israel, they were probably going back to where they had come from, or at least where their family was. They end up going to Nazareth. They end up going to a, a different place. They have to find a different home. They have to meet all kinds of new people. They've got to resettle somewhere else. And that probably, there probably wasn't too many houses on Zillow in Nazareth, and they were probably all expensive and out of their price range. But that's where they went anyway. But God will often, it, it's never, our lives are never a straight path. We want a straight and level path. You see some of the war zones in the country, and, and I, am, I, I always note the ground and all the rubble. And then I also note the people's footwear. It is not usually like the kind of footwear that we wear. And I'm like, how do they walk on that with, the, with that footwear? But what they never have is they never have a straight path. They never have level ground. And our lives are often like that. Some of us have leveler ground than others. Some of our paths are straighter than others. But they're always going to involve a mid-course correction. And Joseph and Mary certainly did. So I, fought, I, I, I saw five things I just wanted to summarize here at the end. The story of Israel's Messiah, again, it includes us Gentiles. That's really good news. None of us like to be kept out talking to a family recently where um, one of the uh, siblings in the family has a spouse that the, other simpli- that the other siblings don't like. And so what do you do at Christmas time? I could ask for a show of hands. You know. How many of you are at what do you do at Christmas time with maybe somebody in your family or some friends? It's just awkward and you, you don't know what to do. You just talked with somebody yesterday. They're just... They just should just pull their hair out because Christmas presents problems. And they really would rather not have those problems. But ultimately, are we gonna are we gonna follow God? Are we gonna follow Jesus? Are we gonna treat people the way Jesus would treat them? Because then at the end of the day, we're satisfied and we can be fulfilled. That's where patience and forgiveness and forbearance and all of those words come into play. But uh, we want to belong. Everybody wants to belong. The Gentiles didn't belong in the beginning. But God, from the beginning, was always making a way for them, was always making a way to include everyone. And then number two, let's remember that the world's values and kingdom values will always be different as they should be. Sometimes, especially us in our communities and, and in our neighborhoods and in our counties and states, we, we think that around us the world should be like us. But if we're really following Jesus, we're going in the opposite direction of the world. And let's just, let's just recognize that. Let's not never abandon the kingdom of heaven for the kingdoms of the earth to fit in down here. Um, and then number three, not just religious, let's not just be that, but let's also nurture our relationship with the, thankfully, triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who we get to interact with in three different ways that really envelop us in a relationship with God. So it's good to be religious, it's good to have tradition and ritual and spiritual practices that draw us closer to God, but then we gotta draw closer to God. We gotta remember that he's the point of all of it. And then number four, are you and am I like these magi, are, are we seeking Jesus? Or did we arrive a long time ago and we're good? We're good. Or, or can you always get closer? Can you always increase the intimacy? Are you still seeking Jesus? Jesus. Number five, and lastly, don't be surprised when you encounter opposition. It's a normal, natural part of life's journey with Jesus is opposition. He found it. He had opposition. And he said, if they didn't like me and you follow me, they're probably not going to like you. 
But that's okay. That's okay, because if God likes us and we like God, that's where we want it to be. So again, God's will for our lives, it isn't always easy. In fact, it's just the opposite. But it is always rewarding and fulfilling. And remember, to follow Jesus requires courage and faith and sacrifice. All of those things. All of those things. We just looked at 23 verses of the Christmas story. All the rest of the verses are just more of the same. More of the same. Struggle, reward, call, pain, relationships, hardship, blessing. It's all the grist of life. But again, at the end of the day, when we lay our heads down, have we walked with Jesus that day? Are we, are we seeking Jesus? Because if we seek him, we will find him. If you're seeking Jesus this morning, his arms are wide open. They were outstretched on the cross and they're outstretched to each of us today, saying, believe in me. I died for your sins. I paid for your sins. Believe in me. Receive me. Follow me. Obey me. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, things aren't going to go that great. (laughs) Things may not go that great to begin with, but when you have a relationship with Jesus, they're rewarding still. And God, you know that you're, you're walking in the will of God, and things, things, ultimately, things ultimately are going to be just great, even though they may not go that great along the way. But without Jesus, without Jesus, there's no hope. So choose Jesus. Believe in him. Follow him. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this, this short passage with the Magi. I thank you for these guys who were willing to step out and go. We, we have no idea the drama and the, the adventure that was their trip. Um, but it was important enough to be written about in Scripture for all eternity. Their story is told. And their story speaks to us and says, you're wanted, you're invited, you're included. All the Gentiles can come to the Savior of the world. So, Lord, I pray if there's someone here this morning who's never come, that they would come. They would come to you with their guilt, with their shame, with their sin, with their mistakes and their faults and their failures. They would find forgiveness through faith in Jesus. God, I pray you would work in all of our hearts. I pray that you would help us this week as we're with family and friends, as we're doing different things. Help us to love and serve well. In Jesus' name, amen.